and we're hoping that uh, we're going to be able to use what you teach us today and uh, so we can get our kids to be better writers. And we're going to shut off a couple of lights and then, uh, and then we'll let you get started. Great. Thank and if you, you have any great. questions, please ask. Well, I would love to first um, just have a bit of a conversation with you. So I've only been to Colorado, um, I think twice actually. I've been to Denver once and Colorado Springs once. So I love Colorado. Um, of course, I say that with the certainty of someone who's never been there in winter. So I might change my opinion if I have to face a lot of snow coming from Seattle. Um, I would just love to hear about what some of your existing strategies, challenges, successes have been. First, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Adora Svitov. I'm uh, 14 years old. I'm a student as well as a teacher and a writer. My first book is called Flying Fingers, Master the Tools of Learning, Do the Joy of Writing. And I wrote this when I was seven to really give my peers an overview of writing and how it wasn't scary at all. My second book, Dancing Fingers, took that same approach to poetry. I co-authored it with my older sister, Adriana. And again, because a lot of kids have this sort of attitude towards poetry that is, oh, it's this scary old thing that people, the writers who are dead now just did a long time ago. I like to say that's really not true. Um, not all poetry has to rhyme. Poetry is something that is still very modern and that you can keep on updating. So that was really my goal with Dancing Fingers. So as you can tell, I love to write. I also love to work with students on writing. And create writing together, and I'll be talking about a few of the things that I like to use, as well as what I love to see as a student of writing uh, in my own experience. So what uh, what have you been working on with students already? Are there any things in particular that are new this year that you're doing in your language arts classrooms? Well, I I'm going to let the language arts uh, personnel talk. We have two right now that are with us. Uh, we, we, call, we try to implement what's called the right tools, which is just a, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but just a, kind of an offshoot of six traits. And trying to simplify the writing process as far as planning, getting the thoughts on paper concisely. Um, so, but in the classrooms, then what we try to do is implement it, our district as a whole. And that's where we, we have fallen short. And we think that if we can get our students using the same kind of system from kindergarten all the way through their senior year, that we will help them to become better writers, you know, to meet things like state assessments and to make sure that they're showing achievement. So um, I don't let Ms. Lynn, our sixth grade language arts teacher, talk about some specific things like the planning and things like that that she's doing. Okay, we do uh, what I call an informal outline. We have taken a, what they've done in the elementary from key chart notes to putting it to informal outline. My biggest problem I'm finding is the kids keep telling me, I don't know enough, I haven't done enough. And I go back and say, well, what did you do in football? What are some strategies? What, what do you do in sports? Well, I don't play sports. What do you do in video games? What do you do with Legos? To get them to write down and brainstorm. Um, there's just, we have some very good successes, but I'm going to say probably 40% are still struggling on how am I going to put this down and then write it coherently. Where that idea it. generation stage, yeah, definitely. I know because so many of my peers, when I ask them, what don't you like about writing, it's, it's so hard to come up with ideas. And I know that my older sister, she's a pretty, she's a very good writer, but when she has like an essay prompt on a test, she took five minutes just kind of staring at it for a little while trying to make the ideas happen. So I guess when I'm working with students and they're having a lot of difficulty coming up with ideas, I basically use those same techniques of asking questions. Another thing that I love to do is to really collaboratively write with students. If I see that students are having a lot of difficulty after I've handed them an assignment, then I would say let's work on this together. Why don't I um, get ideas to be contributed from everyone? And I think that when students are seeing that there's less pressure, oh, I have to make this assignment, it has to be really, really good, that when they see that I'm doing the writing and that they're just contributing ideas, then it can really help them be a little uh, freer, I guess. So that's one of the things that I love to do. Are there any other um, strategies challenges, successes that you face? Well, I teach stuff in 8th grade and I try to align with my co-teacher here. 
So we just worked at planning and trying to organize their ideas. So mine, I kind of give them a start. It's not so much creating those ideas, but trying to organize them. And then, uh, I guess, motivating them to develop enough to support it, to have something to say. Like they just want to say the bare, bare minimum. Um, yeah, like how many sentences does this have to be? Definitely, I yeah. know <laughs> students want to ask that sort of question. I think that's a problem too, because when students are asking how many sentences this need to be, how does this need to be a complete paragraph, and that definitely shows that they're not as invested in the topic as they really should be. I, one of the things that I like to do is ask the students where they use, so for instance, if I'd be teaching persuasive writing, I would ask them where they use persuasive writing in real life, and how they might craft a persuasive argument in real life, so if they wanted their parents to uh, buy them a new video game or something, how would you use a persuasive argument to get your parents to buy a new video game? You can't just say, hey mom and dad, buy me this video game. Would that work? Probably not. So what would you do? Kind of leading students through the process of a real world persuasive argument almost. That's something that I've done that has seemed to work well. I'm sure you've probably used um, various techniques as well. What do you, um, how do you justify and say, like for instance if a student, I'm not sure if students have ever asked outright, why are we doing this? Or, sort of grumbled about something, but how do you emphasize to students how important something is? In anything, or just writing specifically? Anything in writing. Well, you, I keep trying to tell mine that you're going to have to communicate with people one way or another. Writing, and there are going to be times that you can't have that conversation one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to have to write it because there's just so much time strain on you as an adult. They still have not been able to figure that from a sixth grader to an adult world, which I understand that part. But they still are, you know, you've got your great writers, and then it's the students that every day are balking to be able to get them to understand that writing is so important for your own thoughts. Let's try to journal. I even try to get them to journal. And that is like pulling teeth in some areas. So, yeah, what would be, I mean, I try to pick topics that they were interested in or things that they have had to deal with. And I still see that my strugglers, they just, I can't get them engaged. One of the things that I use is that when I talk about writing, I definitely make the notes that this is a lifelong thing. This is something you're going to use in college or after you graduate high school. You use writing everywhere, whatever job you want to do, asking students, what do you want to be when you grow up? And basically, that needs writing, and that needs writing, and that needs writing. But for the students who, for whom the long-term approach isn't quite working, then the short term of here's where you see this kind of writing being used in the real world, and here's how you can use this kind of writing today, is what I do a lot. So for instance, with descriptive writing, I might say, I might give the example of how many of you have ever told a, sto or told a story to a friend and everyone raises their hand, they've all done that. And I say, now imagine if a friend came over and told a story to you and they said, man, I had a lot of fun yesterday. We went to a place and this place was really cool and it was awesome and it had stuff and we loved playing and what would you think of that story? And the students say, well, I didn't really get what was going on. And I say, that's exactly why you need to use descriptive writing. You need to be, you need to explain, you need to describe, because otherwise your story will be very unclear. And so something that really brings the example kind of down to their level to something that they're doing every day anyway, is, has uh, succeeded with some students. Um, that's something that I like to do. As far as today's presentation, I'll be talking some about strategies and some about technology as well. So what is the computer use like in your classroom? Would you say you use the computer every day in the classroom? No. Yeah. We okay. do not have the technology. Minimal. Minimal. Okay. So some of these technologies um, require internet access, but the great thing about them all is that they don't require students to be at a home computer with internet access. So uh, if that's a challenge, then. Uh, that's I'm through. The first thing that I always do when I'm giving a presentation is explaining how the type of writing I'm talking about ties into the real world. 
So with persuasive writing, I sort of mentioned this example, but I might show an example of, say, a menu. This is one from Red Robin. It's always great descriptive writing. And then I ask students to identify where adjectives are and how descriptive writing is being used. So for instance, a uh, sautéed mushroom burger. A mushroom lover's dream come true, loaded with fresh, plump, sautéed mushrooms, a hint of garlic parmesan spread and topped with melted Swiss for that extra yum. And then students will see how there's fresh, plump, sautéed, hint, you know, all these words kind of evoke meaning and can really get your mouth watering. And this is a great example of how descriptive writing can be used in a very short, short little sentence but to convey so much uh, emotion around the food, I guess. And so students really see, wow, descriptive writing isn't just something I find in stories, isn't just something my teacher is assigning me to do. This is everywhere. It's in menus. It's it, whenever I'm trying to argue with my parents and tell them to let me stay up later. So I might have students find the main point, kind of the topic sentence in this little girl's argument. She's trying to say, you should let me stay up later. So that's kind of the equivalent of a thesis statement, because I'm older now and I don't need as much sleep, supporting evidence, I'll be happier and less grumpy about going to sleep, and you know I'm just going to stay at reading if you make me go to bed now anyway, and all my friends' parents let them go to bed way later than me. So I asked students to find where's the main thing she's trying to convince her parents of, where are the supporting details, and what do you think would happen if she just said, you should let me stay up later, and didn't have any of these supporting details. So students really see the point of adding evidence. I also might show an example of, say, an advertisement in a magazine. How an advertisement in a magazine even uses persuasive <coughs> writing. It would have all these reasons listed. Or how politicians give speeches about why they should be elected. Um, another advertisement there. Really drawing it into the real world, showing students, hey, these are examples of where this writing is being used. It's not just something on paper that you have to do for this long off uh, thing. You can make advertisements, you can use your persuasive writing skills to convince your parents of things. It's very useful to you right now. Being a writer is also incredibly important. For me, when I tell students that I write, I write every day. Some people are actually surprised that I would want to write, but the point of being a writer, I think, is that it really models the writing behavior. Students see that I love writing and that I'm not scared of writing, but that I really approach it with a spirit of adventure, I guess. And I think that hopefully that rubs off a little bit. So the idea of modeling writing behaviors, not showing students any antipathy towards writing, I guess, and I'm sure that this isn't something you do, but I know that I talk to students who say, well, my teacher was always, didn't seem to like writing very much. And that was something that made them a little bit less into writing as well. So modeling the writing behaviors with something like collaborative writing can be really handy. Writing in front of your students, being able to work with them to demonstrate. A lot of times students feel that there's a sort of adversarial relationship with writing because, oh, I'm getting this homework and I have to do this. My teacher is just doing this to me, so we have to turn this in. And that's not a very good relationship to start off on. So for me, I love to do collaborative writing, especially when I'm starting off to explain a concept. So if I'm talking about descriptive writing, for instance, one of my favorite subjects, I would ask students, how can we revise this? How do we add details to this passage? How do we add details in this passage to make it more descriptive using the things that we just learned about the five senses? And so, as an example, let's pretend for a moment that you're all young students and I'm just getting started with this, with revising this passage. The treehouse is new, it is made of wood, it adds windows and a door. So I'm going to open up a Word document and take suggestions as far as how to make it more descriptive. So, Anyone have some ideas on, why don't we start with the treehouse? How can we add some details? What are some details you think we should include? Color. Color, definitely. So we should include a detail like color. What are some other details we should include? Size. Size. Great. Condition. Condition. Kind of tree. I'm sorry? Kind of tree. Kind of tree. And, I'm sorry? 
personal feeling towards it. Feeling towards it. Great. How high up the tree it is? Oh, how high up it is. Okay. And one or two more things. Anything else we should probably add about this tree? Who built it? Who built it? Not the tree. Tree house. <laughs> yeah. Where it's located? Where it's located? Okay, so if this is kind of our starter list of details that we should get, then we can start working through revising this passage using all, uh, making sure to hit all these different points. So first, the color. What color should this tree house be? Purple. Purple. The purple, the purple tree house. And why don't we uh, size? How big is this tree house? Gargantuan. The gargantuan purple tree house. <laughs> Okay, so the gargantuan purple tree house, and there's still something more, and I might ask your students, um, instead of saying the tree house is purple, the tree house is big, we can have better sentence structure by, and um, take up less space by saying something like the gargantuan purple tree house stands tall or short. How high up is it? Ten feet. Stand ten, or what if he stands? I guess sits ten feet tall. Hmm, that sounds. Or okay, sits ten feet tall above the. Where is it? Is this a rainforest? Is this a uh, regular forest? Is it in the middle of nowhere? It's their backyard. It's in the oak grove. Above the sorry. Above the oak grove. Above the oak grove in the. Whose backyard? The what family? Mr. Smith's. The Smith's. <laughs> Great. The gargantuan purple trio sits 10 feet tall above the oak grove in the Smith family's backyard. Already in that one sentence, we've really packed out detail. So we have color, we have size, <coughs> uh, we have how high up it is, and type of tree with oak grove, and who built it, Smith family, and where it's located. So now, we can talk about some oops. What about condition and feelings toward it? What kind of condition do you think the treehouse is in? It's a bit dilapidated. <laughs> the treehouse, maybe I can, uh, let's see. Unfortunately, the treehouse is a bit dilapidated. So how can we expand on that? I love getting a From, uh, Sorry. From neglect. I'm sorry? From neglect. From neglect, okay. So there are some floor boards poking out and one, hmm, and a bird has made a nest on the roof. Okay, so now, with what we know about it being dilapidated from neglect, what, what is the Smith family's feelings toward the treehouse? They don't care no more. <laughs> <laughs> so no, remorse because the bird nest is emptied and the children have gone away. <laughs> oh, now that's really out of the So, yeah. this, this one would definitely be a great time to talk about how to add mood to a piece with that uh, rather. Okay, so, and that's very poetically beautiful too. Um, so, the Smith family Jeez. stopped caring about the treehouse long ago when the birds went away and the children. Alright, so, our newly descriptive passage, I will read this out. The gargantuan purple treehouse is 10 feet tall above the oak grove in the Smith family's backyard. Unfortunately, the treehouse is a bit dilapidated from neglect. There are some floorboards poking out, and a bird has made a nest on the roof. The Smith family stopped caring about the treehouse long ago, when the birds went away, and the children too. And then I could go through and edit this a bit. So I might say we've been what word have we been using a lot? So the treehouse, the treehouse, the treehouse. So I might take out one of the instances of treehouse to have better word choice. Um, unfortunately, or I might just say it in this case, unfortunately it is a bit dilapidated from neglect. And then 
having students find any words that they didn't know, new words, things like maybe gargantuan, dilapidated, great words, and using that to review. So in this short activity, only took a couple of minutes that really gets student feedback, and it's really constructed by students, so students can have this pride in the final product that they've helped create, but at the same time, it relieves a lot of that stress that happens when students are handed the assignment and each person has come with a descriptive passage. And that's great to do, I think, right after a collaborative activity when people are a little more confident. Okay, I've seen the teacher do it, now I think I can too. Another effect it has is sort of the poison tester effect. Students can be a bit skeptical of assignments a lot of times, especially if it sounds especially hard and arduous. So, oh, we need to write this three-page essay. What? I bet the teacher would never do this assignment and she had to do it herself. You know, there's a lot of this grumbling and we have it so unfair. By doing this collaborative writing exercise, you're really kind of testing the waters. You're showing students, no, it's not scary. It's perfectly okay. Look, we're doing it together just fine. The collaboration part of it can take away that adversarial, oh, the teacher is doing the student part, it's working together, building a partnership to create a really nice piece of writing. So that's something that I love to do, really for most kinds of writing, whether it's six traits, just um, talking about the six traits, I might have a passage that doesn't have very good word choice and having students identify how we can make it better, the same thing with sentence structure, that always works really well for descriptive writing. This the passage, I could also use it for how to add details with ideas and content. So there's a lot of ways that collaborative writing can be used really well to demonstrate to students, here's how we work through this, and really get them involved as well. So, back to the presentation. <coughs> One of the things I also love from my own writing experience, when I was first learning writing, I was very young when I started writing, about four years old, I would write longhand, and I just loved writing from the moment that I got into it. But I also recall that I was a horrible speller. I was a bad speller, I mean, I guess you might say I was okay for four years old, but I would repeatedly make the same mistakes over and over again, and even me looking back at my old journals, I can't believe how badly I spelled. But the great thing was, was that with the first story I wrote, all complete with its horrible spelling errors and its really a boring lack of confidence and everything, my parents didn't say all that much. They pointed out a couple things here and there, but it was after they said, good job, well done, I really liked how you did all this character and the story and everything. And I think that that helped me as a writer, the fact that they didn't jump immediately to the rules and here's what you spelled wrong, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this, and nice job, which would have been pretty discouraging to me. Gradually, they started reminding me a little more often about when I was misspelling the same things. But because they let me have that freedom early on and really focused on the content versus the form a bit more, I think that that helped me. Another thing was that when I was having difficulty coming up with ideas or when, the, when our class was getting a little bit, I guess, not, not very lighthearted, then we would do a lot of unstructured writing. It would just be free writing. We'd get a piece of paper and it would turn into sort of a game where um, it would be fill up this page as quickly as you can and whoever fills up the page first wins. And there might even be a small prize involved, like a cookie, which was quite nice. There were other times where we would do um, a free write where it would be, okay, you have to write for it non-stop for two minutes and whoever takes their pencil off the paper first, or nobody can take their pencil off the paper at all until you've finished. And that's always fun. And it produces some really hilarious writing as well. This kind of unstructured writing balance with the structure, I think, helped me gain that fluidity as a writer that I could just come up with things right then when I needed to. The great thing was that because it was sort of like a game, a competition, that there wasn't that high stakes, oh, I'm going to get an F on this, much like an assignment or a test would have. So when it wasn't really graded, it was unstructured, that definitely helped me become a bit freer as a writer. Now I'm also a huge fan of outlines and structured writing because I, and as a student of writing, I've written many a formal outline as well with like the Roman numerals and everything too, so I know how important that is for organization. So I think just having a bit of a balance can help students see writing isn't necessarily all about the outlines. It can also be a little um, freer. That might help a bit with like journaling, which, I've, uh, which I know you've been doing with some students. Providing purpose. 
I mentioned this a bit earlier as far as motivating students to write long term versus short term. It's uh, another thing that might be helpful, and this is sort of more of a time with reading, but to provide a purpose for students to have a project, a blog post, a um, creative project. To teach, I first think about what's interesting to me as a learner, what makes learning special for me. And one of the biggest things is that I like being able to use what I learn. Oftentimes, if it's a subject that I don't feel particularly attracted to, I probably won't read a, a 10, 20 pages about it without asking first why am I doing it. Facts seem more relevant to me when I can incorporate them into a creative project. I find it a lot easier to process new information if I'm reading for inspiration or looking for ideas to include in stories, poems, or blog entries. I think that most students are probably this way, as in that they have to see kind of where is this information going, why am I doing this research. So if I have a creative project in mind when I read it, I have a greater sense of purpose. Instead of reading something because my teacher told me to read it, I'm looking for information that will be useful for my purposes to make my creative project better. In this case, I um, know that career purposes motivate students quite a bit, so for instance, if you have a class blog or you're interested in setting up a class blog, that's something a lot of teachers I've worked with have said works really well. Um, there's edu blogs for education WordPress blogger. They all allow you to make it private just to a certain number of people. This is a great way for students to showcase what they have learned and because other students are seeing it and uh, can provide feedback, this is a great way to talk to students about digital netiquette as well if you're interested in incorporating that. Even if it's something traditional on paper with a pencil, that can be great. Anything that just provides students with a purpose, something where they feel like their learning is a little bit more self-directed can help quite a bit. Make writing visual. When students hear something like outline, planning, organizing, it can seem really abstract and a little hard. So you're using um, write tools in the classroom, as I recall. And I think that that really hits that point of making the writing visual. How have the students responded to that? Um, they like it, they enjoy it, the outline, once they get the hang of it, and I model it every week for about six or eight weeks, and they have to write in their composition books exactly, and I'll have a different topic every day. Okay, now we're going to do the outline. What do I do next? What do I do next? You write on the board. What do you do next? And they enjoy that part of it. Great. I'm glad to hear it. That's an an excellent example of the students working together, how much fun can really happen when that takes place. So I think that one of the great things that Write Tools addresses is how to visualize the planning process, how to visualize when you're first coming up with topics. And that's something super important for students to be able to see what they're doing. And so I also love to use various technology tools and get students to kind of create different things. So for instance, if I were um, to talk to students about, okay, we're going to write our three-page essay or something, which would probably be a bit scary sounding, then I might go to a Prezi. Um, how many, has anyone here used Prezi before? No. Okay, so Prezi is just a uh, Zooming presentation software. It's online. And we should have it open. Ah, here we go. So, and it's free without the annoying band as well, which is nice. So I would have something like a class paper, and I could call this the writing process together. And it is not loading very well on the phone, so I'll try it on Safari. Sorry, Max, voice and you give me a bit of trouble. And the computer seems to have crashed. Um, it's always lovely that whenever I'm being a huge advocate for technology, <coughs> things seem to go around. Oh, here we go. Well, let's, let's just do it. <laughs> so I have the brainstorm research results. This is actually just a template that I didn't have to work to create. It was automatically loaded. So I could go and take any of the 
the globes. Ah, here we go. So our paper, we could name this something way better, and just asking students to first go into brainstorm areas. So some various ideas for our paper that we're going to kind of outline as an example. All right, so I'm going to add an idea, the, uh, the superiority of cats. And I want all the students to come up with examples, so. So what are your ideas? What do you think would make a good persuasive paper? My, my idea is the superiority of cats. Why cats are better than all other types of pets. So imagine that you're students. What are some other ideas? Just throw them out there. <laughs> Agility. Okay. Video games, something. Video games, okay. So why? Um, no. Just ideas. Oh, what we're going to write about? What you want to write about? Oh, I thought we were writing about cats. Oh, no. We're just brainstorming. Sorry, I should make that more clear. We're just brainstorming different potential topics that we're trying to convince. Oh, okay. 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 So, well, dude, you're in left field. I guess that was me. No. <laughs> so, we have the superiority of cats. Why? Um, okay, so someone says something about video games. How could we uh, take video games and make that into a convincing topic? Maybe why students should be allowed to play video games in school? I'm not really sure. There's a whole lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Get me all over that. Why students should be allowed <laughs> to play video games in school? Okay. Great. What else? What else do you think would get students fired up? Why the NCAA should abandon the BCS system? Okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna want to write about that. That's partially what's going on. Really? Yes. yes. Now, I um, am struggling to understand both of those acronyms. The NCAA is the na National okay, um, Legion Association of Athletes. That's yeah. it. Okay, I knew I had time to do a sport. <laughs> you can really tell I'm such a huge athlete from my cluelessness about. <laughs> um, whenever here's one. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's one out there. Why schools should get rid of the PDA policy, public display of affection policy. Oh, right. love that. High schools love that. Because it grosses out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I bet students would love that. You're in middle school, right? So, yeah. It's, yes, we are. Exactly, I suppose. Um, now, my, some of my high school friends, because I actually skipped a grade, so I'm in 10th grade, usually I'd be in 9th grade, but um, they, are whenever whenever anybody's showing PDA like in the hallways and stuff, they'll say, "Oh, that's so junior high. That's so middle school." And I just laugh because you think it would be the other way around. Okay, so we have these <laughs> four different topics. We have the superiority of cats. We have why students should be allowed to play video games in school. Why the NCAA should abolish the BCS system. Why schools should get rid of the PDA policy. So we have all these great topics. And now I might have the students vote on one. So, um, raise your hands if you think we should write about why schools should get rid of the PDA policy. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of raised hands. In. That pretty much gets <laughs> 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 that, that was the way I'm like, Okay, so we would highlight this as the, as the one that we're going to use. So, we can make this big. And so, this is our main topic. Now we could move on to our research. So,. <laughs> By research, I mean students could maybe interview the principal or interview their teacher about why does the school have this policy in the first place, interview other students, get some good quotes, maybe um, think of some scenarios, dig up an event where somebody was actually getting it. What, is, what would be the punishment? Like detention or suspension? In school suspension. In school suspension. Yep. Okay. So maybe dig up an incident where there's a very disgruntled student and I should have been suspended uh, just because I was a public display. So they would do all this research, incorporate some of these quotes, some of these anecdotes that they found, as well as their own evidence. So I could maybe uh, go to this part of research. And so what would be some of the uh, evidence in favor of changing the policy? Say that again. So, um, to change the school policy, what would be some evidence in favor of that? 
It creates a feeling of love. Okay, <laughs> it's a feeling of love, an environment of love. It's open. It free spirits. Yeah. <laughs> Less fighting in school because people will be more loving. And respecting their rights. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure how we can see how this CF quality is a bit bigger, but this, so this is um, sounding a lot like Woodstock, actually, but it's actually <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there we have like one thing, so this is definitely great for adding details um, and saying, you know, again, the students, that real world approach, if they're wondering, oh, why are we adding all this? Well, you can't make a very good argument if you just leave it at one sentence, like, we should change the PDA policy. You really have to back up your argument with facts, with research, with um, evidence that you come up with. Okay. So, what's another thing? Uh, maybe... Hmm. An they could research other schools' handbooks. They could look at other schools' handbooks and see what other schools do. Great. That's a school cool place. idea. Okay, so... Maybe, yeah. and so then the students could say many other schools, such as, and insert names of schools without PDA policy, do not have. But there'd be less schools, there'd be less schools. Yeah. 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 They could also maybe um, interview if, if the school's nearby. This, this is getting a little bit more complicated, but if they found one of these handbooks and the school didn't have policy that they could um, send an email or something to the teacher and ask kind of what their reason is. So another thing maybe they could say uh, the suspension, this in-school suspension, this is too severe of a punishment or something. They could, um, what are some other ways that they could dig up some evidence that would be compelling? Do some internet, internet search. Internet search, great. So, uh, Ooh, other countries. Oh, that is a good Ooh. idea. Yeah. So, what? How do other countries treat this? Now, of course, they might be uh, they might be disappointed with that one because I'm sure there are some other countries that have way more severe policies than well. Yeah, there are some other countries that are not as severe. And more exposures. Yes, definitely. So, finding finding oops, that's so, so finding international perspectives. Great. Right? So. We could, and then students could maybe have, um, so if they interviewed the principal or they interviewed a teacher about why the PDA policy was in place and they got some reasons, then they could also have this dedicated to a kind of rebuttal of the reasons, saying, okay, the PDA policy is in place because we don't want it to be a distraction to our learning. Well, it really isn't a distraction to our learning because, and adding compelling reasons, but say, you know, these reasons basically aren't valid. So, that would teach an argument skills, I think. If and then statements. Right, if, if, and then. if and then statements. Um, so, yeah. ultimately having students, just like in the brainstorming stage, having students come up with a big diversity of research from maybe some books, from some interviews, from some online sources, from their own arguments, how they would argue against it. This can be a really fun stage to work with students. Do um, so. Do you take students to the computer lab often? I try to. Yeah, about every six weeks. Every six weeks. Great. So this would be something that might be good for a computer lab visit, as far as the online stuff would be really cool. So then, after the research stage. I drive over results, and here's where students would really refine their ultimate arguments, putting in their topic sentence, putting in the three pieces of supporting details or the evidence that they found and expanding off of that. And so then, at the end, when they're going, they're going to actually write their paper, and they can go back to this and say, oh, here's this little load. So we started with the brainstorm, and then we went to research, and then we went to results. So, and it shows the whole thing nicely, from brainstorming, to research, to results, zooming in on the different evidence and details where students can fill in there. So it's a really nice way of showing kind of the writing journey 
had the same place on screen, and a nice way to collaborate with students as well using technology. So, back to the presentation. Oh, and Blogster. Has anyone used Blogster? Yes. Yeah, well, Double. Blogster is, uh, I would recommend using the education version because otherwise you'll have ads at the top and the side, but Blogster is a really nice poster site where you can make all kinds of interactive posters. The posters have fun text and it can also have videos and pictures even. So this would be a really fun thing to do for a creative assignment. For instance, maybe if you wanted to have students, maybe if you gave an assignment to your students, like how would you teach other students about one of the six traits of writing? And you could group people and each person would work on a trait. So whoever got sentence structure could make a poster and it would have examples of maybe this isn't so great a sentence structure and here's how we would improve it and here's a checklist and they can make really fun, bright, colorful posters and then the winning person's poster, whoever really exemplified the, the values of that trait that they were working on and gave great examples and had nice design can maybe get it printed out and hung up in the classroom, something like that would be a really fun thing to do with Lobster. Making students empowered, giving them the ability to see, wow, I'm a writer, and having that understanding that they can even teach their younger siblings and really help other students understand parts of writing that they learn can be incredibly fun. Yeah. Okay, I just have a question on the last one when you're brainstorming in the middle, because sometimes I get stuck. Um, so we had some, like you said, Woodstock answers of it would promote love and openness. I feel like if it was in my classroom, my responses would be, for PDA, would be, it's stupid, it's unfair. And then I don't know where to take them, to, where do you take them to get them to come to something that's reasonable, I guess, in, in an adult of view. So Moving them from the dark side. <laughs> that's a very good point, because, yeah, you're right, or since we, you all are right. adults, then the answers that you gave me probably wouldn't be replicated in your classroom. So when you get answers like, it's stupid, it's unfair, I would definitely ask questions to that individual further. So, it's stupid, why is it stupid? And that can, you know, go circular, students reply, well, I don't know, it's stupid, but I guess, um, which is probably likely to happen. But one thing I would do is write an example argument, and I'm sure that they've seen a lot of examples, but saying, you know, you really need to support your case because adults who make these policies aren't going to be swayed by things like, it's stupid, that's loaded language, that's just really not supported by evidence. And maybe um, giving students the chance to see, kind of like when you make a case in a courtroom, you can't just say, so-and-so definitely did the crime. Nobody would listen, you have to provide evidence. Here are the fingerprints, here are the, here's the letter that was written, um, slipped under the door. I don't know how creepy you would want to get with that example, but it's in <laughs> any case you need to have evidence. And so maybe making it almost like a game. So perhaps instead of something serious like the PDA policy, you could make it something like, okay, so and so has been accused of stealing another student's cat. Now we're going to put him or her on trial, and both sides have to come up with evidence maybe creating some sort of scenario where students feel, oh, okay, I can do this. Um, so like a debate about something, a, um, a trial, those are all things that are really fun um, for me and experience. I think that the important thing for students to realize is that, and I think most students will probably realize at some point is that saying it's stupid, it's unfair, won't work too well. So possibly, I'm not sure how easy this would be to set up, but if you had students writing persuasively about a subject like the PDA policy, maybe saying, okay, in two weeks, the winning or the, the student who came up with the best argument gets to present their argument to the principal or something that really makes students excited, a little bit stressed out in a good way, thinking, wow, we actually are going to be doing something important. So those are all things that I would hope might work in such a situation. Um, I guess also some cloud writing, so I would take something like it's unfair and make a list of reasons why it's unfair. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's made me think quite a bit as well. Um, you can use cloud writing 
with something like Google Docs. Now, how many of you, do you would you say the majority of your students have computers at home? Not no. Not access to no. the internet, no. Okay. Um, how, and so you said about every six weeks you can take them to the computer lab. Right, it'd be free for six graders, and then you have to wait for, you know, you have to sign up. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, something that requires internet access at home, then like Google Docs might not be so viable, but I'd like the ones that, um, something like Prezi or Blogs, the good thing about that is that it's definitely great for a computer lab, and the student could log in with the teacher's account on multiple computers. So, that's something that might be a little more viable. To review some of the things that I've seen that work really well, uh, Prezi, Blogster, having a class blog to give students some of that purpose in their writing, um, allowing students to come up with creative projects, having a bit of unstructured writing as well to kind of help that create their ideas to flow, and uh, demonstrating writing, modeling writing behaviors, really getting students to say, I'm a writer, and have that pride in writing. One thing I might also add is giving students the chance to find some of their favorite writers and kind of identify how they write. So looking up someone like um, Neil Gaiman who wrote Coraline or who wrote Diary of a Wimpy Kid, his name is escaping me. Any of the favorite writers who might have a website or who might have a place where they kind of show rough drafts of their writing or writing in action, that really helps students see what actual writers do Polish writers do and how they can improve their craft. Whenever you give students a sense of a final product that maybe what they say or what they write has importance, can be published somewhere or can be heard somewhere, will help someone, that adds that purpose and that extra level of interest in it. So I think that just going from the long-term goals of this is something that you need in order to get into a good college or in order to succeed after high school, and moving to some more maybe short-term goals but that students can really see directly in front of them the relevance and importance of is something I find to work really well. So are there any questions I can answer? <laughs> How would you, as a student yourself, what do you see your students in writing come to play in mathematics or um, you know, and some of the other contents that students have to do because it's not just the writing that we're trying to do. We're trying to incorporate writing strategies in <coughs> different content areas. And so, you know, as being there as yourself, how do you use that in your math class? That's a great question. Well, I love math, but it wasn't always that way. When I was um, around the same time I started writing, I really hated math. I would just I um, was so angry when I had to do it, and um, you know, memorizing my multiplication tables was such a challenge. So one thing my parents did when they were first introducing math to me before I actually started school was um, encouraging me to write some word problems, so just like for basic addition and subtraction. And because I loved writing, then word problems came naturally to me. But of course, to create a correct word problem, I had to really understand the thinking behind it. So that was something that I did. Um, now I uh, do math my math class online actually because of all my traveling and my teaching. So um, in my online math class then there isn't a whole lot of writing because it's geometry but we um, it's mostly drawing constructions. But I could definitely see uh, with writing one thing that might be good would be having students explain something. So how would you, if you were going to teach someone else this concept that you just learned, how would you explain it clearly and concisely? and maybe having students do that as a warm-up or as an activity. And that's a really great way to kind of test whether they have learned it or not. Um, I, because I don't really have much experience with mathematics aside from being a student and knowing that word problems really helped me in my learning, uh, I wouldn't know specifically what to add to that. But what have you been doing, I guess, to incorporate writing your math? <coughs> Well, right, like, like you were saying, they write the algorithm because a lot of times on their standardized tests, they have to explain how they got the answer, which is basically writing the algorithm. Mm, okay. So... Which are step... Oh, sorry. Instruction. I'm sorry, I was just saying it has the step-by-step -step instructions, and a lot of them want to put the adjectives in, and I'm like, no, I need the basics. 
That's super hard because whenever you incorporate writing into a different subject, it requires different things. So when yeah, when you're incorporating writing into mathematics, students are probably bursting with all the new information they learned about how to write effectively in language arts, and then suddenly it's no, cut out the adjectives. We're not going to describe how beautiful the number four is. <laughs> and that can definitely be a bit confusing to students. I think really outlining here's there are different kinds of writing that use in all kinds of scenarios. The type of writing that an engineer is going to use when he sends an email about this new bridge that he wants to build is going to be way different than the language that a writer uses when he or she is creating a poem, or that the President of the United States uses in his State of Union speech. So really, maybe having students compare two or three kinds of writing and explain how they're different would help perhaps clear up some of that. I know exactly what you mean because I have to resist that temptation to use all kinds of flowery language when it's probably not necessary. What about social studies? Um, how have you incorporated writing with uh, history? Well, with social studies, really we do a lot of writing. And uh, I, I, there's really two underlying rules. I want to know what they know, and then I want to know what they think about it. And when you put those together, I mean, I'm, I'm with sixth grade right now, and one of the large things that I'm working with is just the mechanics of writing still. So we have a wide variety of students that can write a page and a half on one question, and we still have a few that will barely do one sentence. So, I mean, we, 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 I really want to know what they know to begin with, because I have to grade what they do know. But secondly, it's important to me to know what they think about it, and that's the hard thing to get from them. So forming opinion and being able to get that opinion down on paper, communicate it? Right. Interesting. Right. Yeah, I would think that that would be the easier part to for students to write, over. but then again, I'm just building off my own experience, and I love to talk, so that would, I'd probably be one of those page and a half, um, bordering on war and peace length <laughs> responses. Um, I think that for the students who are a bit less inclined to share their opinion, um, hmm, maybe creating a scenario where sharing their opinion is more essential. One, have you, um, trying to think of, I know that there was a social studies class, some of my classmates um, in, in another class have, where they put historical figures on trial, and so different people were lawyers and judges and jury, and they all had to come up with their opinion because they were putting this figure on trial, and that was apparently a really fun, pretty awesome assignment that everyone loved. When you're Trying to get students to provide their opinion, why do you think it is that they're not writing more? Is it because they're sort of afraid of how it factors into the grade? I think it's more of a social peer aspect. Um, if they have to share aloud the possibility that someone may criticize or, well, let's be honest, at this level, cut down. It's one of the things that at the middle school level is something we face every day. But in the classroom, it's, I've witnessed it as the principal going into a classroom and I just did this yesterday and I said you're going to write this because they want us to fluent. It's, it's a line between getting them to understand that they're independent and that they can think for themselves and break away from elementary where it's just there and it's going to be laid out for them but now you've got to become free thinkers and trust yourselves and just gain that confidence. That's the hard part I think as teachers when you have such a different range of abilities in the classroom. So, you know, that fear, just the self-confidence, lack of, that's what I tried to say. Uh, I also think it's, it's part, we're also going into another realm too, because uh, we're discussing writing, but I, I really think it uh, reflects a lot of their reading abilities, uh, where they're fluent, but they're really not gaining the understanding of what they're reading. So, I mean, we're working with these things on all levels, but uh, it's, it, those problems are there as well. Now, one strange thing that I'm seeing, I have, a, I have one seventh grade class where we do tons and tons of writing, and it's 100% um, opinion pieces, persuasive works. And what's, what's really strange to me is we've, we've done a lot of uh, oral discussion too, and what's surprising to me is how articulate Many of them are orally, and how very poor it is when they put it on paper. There's a huge oh. disconnect there. Yes, 
because I, well, I love talking, I love writing, so I think I can sort of navigate between them both, but then my older sister also loves talking, also has really strong opinions, but when it comes to communicating them on paper, sometimes with her persuasive essays, um, not so much. So, bridging that disconnect, whenever I'm doing persuasive writing with students, I would try to start sort of this oral discussion, really get people with strong opinions on either side to essentially be arguing a little bit, and then I start writing down exactly what they're saying so they can say, wow, what I'm saying really can look good on paper. And seeing how I'm taking basically what the ideas that are already in their head, what I'm saying, so if your students are already articulating really well, just kind of immediately transferring that on the paper and saying, here, look, these are your ideas, now go, on, go and expand on them. I guess if students see, I have the ideas already, that's not a problem, I can just write them down and work from there, um, maybe that would be a good thing. It's, if it's the self-confidence that's involved, then, um, and, and it's reading aloud, then it seems like they wouldn't be so enthusiastic in the discussion stage. So, I guess, um, do you think that the student's writing ability, that the, that they're a bit nervous about sharing with other students because they're worried about the mechanics of their writing? I, I, well, I don't know that, I don't know if it's across every class and every grade level, but to me, I'm, I, yeah, I, I mean, it must be the actual, it must be the mechanics, because when they, when they verbalize it, you don't like, for example, if you ask a particular student a question and you kind of draw them out to where they'll actually give, in, give you an extended response and it sounds fairly succinct and clear, but that same students, if they will provide that extended response on paper, it's this like eight-line run-on sentence with you, it's almost unreadable. To piggyback on that, where we really, I think, struggle overall, our students have so many gaps that it's not even for them to get the information down on the paper. I mean, they don't know their parts of speech, they don't know complete sentences, and then half of what they're tested on is reading, and the other is language use. And so they don't know the language use, so especially as an instructor, it's good for me to hear this to really work on the buy-in into writing, but still I'm so worried about that they don't have basic mechanics. They're seventh and eighth graders. And so how do you fix those gaps and make that connection that you're not killing their enjoyment of writing, but trying to find some improvement in those basics and that knowledge. And a lot of it is exactly what you gave us as an example. They said this about that and it was really good. They'll, they'll do that for a half of a page and not tell you a thing. <laughs> so, so that's that's what we're fighting against. So do the students understand when they create a piece of writing that is pretty unsatisfactory, do they understand, do they have the understanding that their writing needs improvement? Yes. That's a great question because in the same class the, this last week, we actually as a class kind of anonymously read aloud and discussed the paper, so no one knew whose paper it was. But I had them analyze it orally as a class and give feedback, and, 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 and it continued to baffle me because they knew exactly what was wrong with it. They, they seem to know how to fix it, and yet it doesn't, it doesn't translate onto paper for some reason. Like, I couldn't believe how tuned in to what the problems were and how to fix it, they were, given the fact that these kids with these amazing critiques are the ones doing the exact same things when they write it themselves. Wow, that's such a strange paradoxical situation. Did the students then kind of like take what? their papers back and revise them? Uh, we haven't actually done revisions of their own work. Again, this is, this is kind of in, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick a paper at random that a student wrote in the class, and I'll read it aloud, and they'll they'll hear how the paper reads, and they'll be able to pinpoint exactly what's wrong with it. But when they write the paper, it's like they're totally oblivious to it. That's a 
they don't have to they have to read that sentence aloud, they fix it when they say it. And, but they don't, after they put it on paper, they just put it So they aren't focusing on the prevention, they're kind of focusing on the, the cure afterwards. Interesting. But they prefer that to cure their own work. That's the problem. Like, they write things down and they get their ideas on paper, and then they're done. Like, if it's on paper, even if the sentence makes no sense at all, it's done. I, they don't go back and read what they've written and fix it. <clears throat> Focus on quantity, not quality. Yep. Just so right, get it done. Yeah. Check it off. Yeah. Yeah. We're not there. And well, if I go back and make them, like, read me the sentence that you just wrote, <laughs> I'm like, oh, it doesn't make sense. Right. But they don't go back on yeah. their yeah. own yeah. volition and read it. Oh. So if it's the, the students are having difficulty with, uh, or it could be that students are being a bit careless, and also that they feel that the pressure is, oh, I have to write a page instead of I have to write a really good Maybe something to try would be having each student write the, um, tell each student, okay, you each should try to write the best sentence you've ever written. And maybe give the students something to write it about. It could be a treehouse or it could be an event, whatever. And tell us students, how will you write the best sentence you've ever written? And by having students write something really short, like a sentence, or maybe two or three, um, maybe you would take away that focus on having a really big amount of quantity and just to say, we're going to focus just on the sentence, and we're going to make it really good. And if students are saying things like, the food was good, was the sentence, then you could say, is that really the best sentence? Could you add more to that? Could you be more specific and work with students? And maybe that quantity would make it a little more manageable, and um, that's just sort of an so idea that think occurred. We need to stop focusing so much on quantity and poor quality. It's what it comes down to us, period. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because we're telling them, hey, you got to write a page, or you got to write this long. Instead, just stick to the quality part. And like she's saying, go to simple sentences, one or two sentences. Instead of, you know, saying, hey, you need to write for this period. That affects the bottom. Right? Do you have some students in that class that maybe they're trying really hard to sound like, I, I, as a music teacher, I had a student, we had to write papers for, about music. And I had a student that I was working with that she could verbally tell me all this beautiful stuff that's happening in this music. But then as soon as she went to go write it on paper, she was almost trying too hard because she wanted to make it sound better. And so she was trying to get too much in there. And pretty soon I had the mechanics of it, you know, run on sentences, words that really just didn't seem to fit with what she was telling me. Well, one of the things I am seeing, and I really wanted to ask you, particularly given your age, that I think might be really contributing to some of the, the readability problems and the structure, and moreover the conventions, is it almost looks like they are permanently writing text messages. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not totally convinced that that they can change gears. Like I I, I don't even know what to think about it. Well, I'm a can I speak? It's we just went to, two of us just went to a writing in the digital age, and something they just explained to us, we need to change. That's part of the problem. We do need to start, we need to start adapting our thoughts and our thinking, because the way he's an actual language arts teacher that taught it was explaining that the fact that, depends on who the audience is, he allows them to write sometimes in text messages. Are they, are they getting the point, their, their point across of what they're trying to do? So that's the part that we have to start somewhat adjusting our, our thinking somewhat. Because whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not, that is how they communicate, that's how they collaborate. There, there's assignments that we can do that. that. And that's what I mean, it's right, but it's right. But the Just jump on in on that. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> so what it, to me, and I, I as the language arts teacher, I see this, what is a good way for them to learn to edit? Because I haven't found a good one yet. For them to actually take, I mean, I've done the fold the paper, say you've got a, pair, a sentence, that's, you know, the sentence starts with a capitalized word, you've got punctuation at the end, you add the verb, but you do that maybe half a year and then after that they just throw stuff on your edit sheet. So my question is, what would be a good way for them to learn to edit themselves? 
Really good question. Editing was one of the things I, as a writer, struggled with quite a bit. I really hated finding all my run-on sentences and my comma splices, and I thought it was a big pain. So after a while, I guess I realized just kind of gradually, wow, well, editing is this incredibly essential part of writing that came with um, that was essential to create a good final product. But one of the things I did was I would have an editing checklist with me and I would check things off and I guess that the routine of it made it a little easier for me. I wouldn't say that it made it a whole lot more fun. Um, there's Sometimes I guess students have to realize that editing is not necessarily the um, most enjoyable part of the writing process, but possibly if you maybe gave students um, some challenges, like uh, here's a piece of text and it looks pretty perfect, but there's one hidden error that's sneaking in there, and you find it, and maybe really challenge <coughs> students to treat it almost as a game, kind of like find the problem, and then changing it. Uh, another possibility is if students exchange papers, maybe you could do it uh, almost like a like a secret Santa sort of thing where, oh, I'm going to edit someone's paper, I don't know who it is, it's only identifiable by a number or something, and then we're all going to trade and we'll see how we like each other's edits. Um, really turning it into something that's a bit more lighthearted, perhaps. When it comes to editing their own work, I always tell students, writing is the mark that you make on the world, and you want to make sure that mark is something you can be proud of. So giving students a sense of ownership. Perhaps saying, okay, we're going to uh, whoever has the best piece of work, we're going to make um, an, an anthology of works that students have written over the course of the year, and we're going to do it online, or we're going to do it in an actual book. So you want to make sure to edit, because that will give your work a better chance of being in an anthology, or um, you know, getting a wider audience, I guess. Just as long as students see there's a point to the editing, I think that that really helps take away a lot of the, uh, I don't want to do this kind of attitude. To go back to um, what uh, I was hearing about the digital writing, or the writing in the digital age, that's a really good point about sort of how students are often uh, writing in text messages. I think that it's still incredibly important to be able to traditionally write a long-form essay, but at the same time, definitely making it relevant to what students are seeing and what students are experiencing. So maybe how would you write a convincing email to get a sponsor, for instance, or a to, if you were fundraising for charity, then how would you write a persuasive email? <coughs> really making it something that students see the point of. Maybe providing each student with a challenge of some sort. That's why I love doing the whole classroom blog thing, because it's getting students to do that. Another thing I've heard of that's worked well for some language arts classrooms is 140 character stories. So a teacher would have a Twitter account, It would you could lock it for privacy concerns. And then each student would come up with a 140 character story. So 140 characters is about a sentence, two sentences. And the whole concept behind the 140 character story came about because of Ernest Hemingway's very famous story, um, For Sale, Baby Shoes, Never Worn, which was sort of the shortest story. And so challenging students to work in a very concise, not really driven by a big quantity, but really kind of taking it in the other direction. How do you tell a story well? How do you give detail in this very short little amount of space? And so because students are going to be forced to use their words very economically, you probably won't see as many of the, the food was good type of sentences that don't really serve a point. So kind of forcing students into that ultra concise form of writing might help uh, as far as some of the um, better writing principles. Okay, any other questions? No? Great, well I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you, hearing about your students, and I hope to someday be able to visit Colorado, that would be really nice. And I've learned a lot from hearing about your experiences and some of the students that you've been dealing with and the different forms of writing you've been working with. So I would um, you know, love to stay in touch, and I hope that the session has been enjoyable. If any of you want to contact me, um, then my website, dorsetontalk.com, is always available, and all my programs are listed on CILC.org. Thank you so much for connecting. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.